welcome everyone to the Institute of World Politics. For those of you who are new, <laughs> IWP is a graduate school of national security and international affairs. We have five master's degree programs, 18 certificates of study, and a new doctoral program. We also offer the opportunity to take a single course without having to pay an entire semester's worth of tuition costs. And one can also audit such a course at a much less cost. If you're interested in learning more about us, please feel free to speak to one of our staff at the conclusion of this event. And now a little bit about Eric. Um, Eric Fulton is a business owner and technologist. His first job was hacking international corporations in order to help them identify vulnerabilities and secure their information systems. He has published independent research at universities, presented at the prestigious Black Hat Conference, and the world's largest hacker conference, DEF CON. Eric went on to build a successful global banking network with a strong presence in Asia. And as an advocate for privacy and international or internet freedom, Eric continues his mission to contributing to a secure, free, and open internet. He is currently employed at, as the identity evangelist for Keybase, a company dedicated to solving identity and encrypted communication. So that's enough from me. Everybody please help me in welcoming Eric. Hello. Uh, after that long introduction, which I appreciate, it's good to remember we're all still human. Uh, what I'm going to do and, and hope throughout this talk uh, is not use too much technological jargon. So if I say a word that you don't know what it means, just raise your hand and, and ask questions. I like things to be interactive. Uh, I can talk at you all day long, but I think it's more interesting to answer nagging questions that you have about the world and technology, etc. Uh, so with that, I'd like to start with a story. There's a lot of different stories I have. My, uh, my first job was hacking and breaking into corporations. Greatest first job uh, I think I could have ever had. I have a very exploitation-based mindset, which I feel bad. There's people that love building, and I love breaking, uh, and I've just accepted that that's my skill. And so for mine, uh, a lot of my job was breaking into corporations and in coming from the perspective of an attacker. There's different levels, as we describe, of types of attacks, and so there's uh, arbitrary or random attacks, kind of the, the attacks on the street, someone trying to just break in an attack of opportunity, uh, the door was unlocked, then there's more targeted attacks and then nation state attacks. Because I'm the, uh, the technology person in my, my family that many people know, oftentimes people will ask, is someone going to hack me? And most times I can tell them, I'm, I, no harsh feelings, you're not important enough. <laughs> uh, the average American probably thinks that they're more important than they are, but if they're not carrying national secrets in their head or have a security clearance, probably not worth it. But it's an interesting point that we're, we're at right now with Dragnet style security and surveillance of whether you're important or not, uh, it's so easy to collect information about people that on the off chance you may be important someday, they're collecting a lot of information about you anyways. Uh, one of my first hacking engagements was uh, what's called a red team attack. And so what that is, I'm just allowed to attack a company within ethical boundaries uh, to see if I can break into their information systems. What that means is, uh, even though for me the easiest thing to do would be to break into the back window of the CEO's car and steal their laptop, uh, I can't do that. But I do have a lot of creativity in breaking in. And I love breaking in. So for this particular organization, the CEO had a little bit of a uh, challenge for me. I was a little bit younger, and he went, we're incredibly secure. I don't think you have any chance of breaking in. As many people often feel like, right? You put a lot of time into your information security process. You've hired people. You've got a good security posture. But for me, that's more of a call to action. Uh, and so I thought, okay, let's get crafty. And this was around the time of, has anyone here jailbroken their cell phone or know what that means? couple people. Uh, so that's where on your cell phone, if you want free apps, uh, you can effectively hack it and install things. Most recently, uh, I think it involves every iPhone up to the 8 or 9. There's currently a jailbreak out there that's got a soft reboot, but allows an attacker to break into your phone and have full access to what's on there. And when you think about it, what's on your phone? Not just strictly information, but also location information, uh, who you interact with, passwords. At this point, your credit card's in your bank. There's a lot of information on there. And so I thought, okay, how am I going to both make a point to the CEO that I can break in, and how can I do it in such a way that's a little more crafty? And 
so I did a little bit of open source research and people are becoming more and more uh, knowledgeable of this today. People maybe now have a LinkedIn profile, people are starting to delete their Facebook profiles, but four or five years ago, oh man, it was free for all on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, here's where I am today, here's exactly what I'm doing, which makes it really easy for you to gain information on A, where they are and what they're doing, but B, use that to your advantage. So for him, I saw that he was at a conference a month ago, just right there on his LinkedIn profile about he was attending this interesting conference and was a speaker there. So what I did was I thought, okay, I'm going to give him a cell phone. Uh, naturally, it's one that was pre-cracked and uh, had a little bit of extra software on it. And that cell phone was going to be, uh, I included a little pamphlet that said, you won a door prize for uh, attending this conference, and for attending it, you were selected to win this cell phone. And for most people, if you win a brand new iPhone, first thing you're going to do is use it, right? If you've got a year or two old phone, it's like, this is awesome. Uh, but right before I sent it out, our team had cooked up a little application. We had cracked the iPhone uh, and installed a little application that would turn the microphone on five minutes before every calendar appointment, five minutes after every calendar appointment, and then mail us that audio recording. And because we were more ethical, we scoped it only during business hours because I don't want to be listening to people's microphones on their cell phones at various times of the day. Uh, and I should say, this is partially why I'm a little bit more paranoid as a person now, is when you're listening to someone else's cell phone in real time, you kind of go, that's creepy. <laughs> that could be happening to me. Uh, so we sent that cell phone to him. It was a little bit of a crapshoot because, you know, even if you send someone a free cell phone, maybe they have the operational security in their mind to go, maybe this isn't a good thing, or maybe I should, should look this gift horse in the mouth. Um, but such a rush of adrenaline when you're watching your server and a day and a half later, all of a sudden you get a phone home and you see that he's uploaded his email contacts, he's typed in his passwords to his exchange server, we now have access to his corporate network. It was amazing. And we had his corporate Wi-Fi code. So with a $700 iPhone, uh, I was able to drive out in front of the organization, log into their Wi-Fi, log into their domain controller, which for most uh, Windows-based organizations is what controls their information access policies, and uh, have full access. It was a good time. Uh, but what's more interesting is now we're moving away from that. We're moving into uh, a new type of space. You guys are in D.C. It is way more fun to see what happens between nation states and individuals because it's a bit more of a shadow game. Uh, most of my observations are going to come externally. Like I didn't just sit down with the SFB and go, hey guys, what are you doing to attack people? Uh, I mean, that would be a good conversation, but not one I think they would want to have with a foreign person. But it is very, uh, something to be reticent of is that we are all becoming more and more high value targets and the uh, value chain is being pushed further and further down. You don't need to attack the CEO and arguably you don't want to attack the CEO because if he notices, he can take direct action in making the company more secure. If he realizes he's been hacked, he realizes he's a target, and that's not something you want front of mind. So it's probably best to take the information uh, that you want and then try and find the least privileged person with access to that information. Uh, so let's take a look at ooh, incentives and goals of other countries. I think it's very well documented at this point. Uh, Russia wants to disrupt our social structure, China wants our stuff, uh, and most likely our information. But it is also, they're becoming more sophisticated in their dragnet style uh, approach to acquiring information. Just curious, does anyone in here have the app TikTok installed? All right, awesome. Much more of a, I mean, teenager, I would say, styled app and targeted at this moment, but uh, that app is owned by a Chinese company. And suddenly, that app is on millions of Americans' phones. And people don't realize when you have an application on a phone and you say, oh, yeah, I'll give access to the things that I didn't read. Uh, one of those things is location data. One of those is uh, cell phone history data. Because they need to read your text message, phone book data. And so suddenly, a foreign country is able to build out a, an externally based social profile network of the United States based on cell phone numbers, which uh, for data breaches at this point, how many people have changed cell phone numbers in the last five years? I think I'm a weird one and I change every year and it annoys the crap out of everyone in my family. 
But for everyone else, uh, it's turned into something that's what's called a primary key or a way to index information uh, for you specifically, because it's not something that changes that often. It's not something treated secretly like a social security number, and it is something that you fill out on just about everything. So suddenly, if there's a data breach, I can merge your phone number with everything else. And at this point, everyone's been hacked. Home Depot. You wouldn't think that Home Depot data would be useful, but now we've got this amount of information correlated. Just recently, today, 1.2 billion records from data aggregators was actually just hacked. Again, surprise. Uh, and that's part of my personal uh, endeavor is to create legislation around making things more private. Not necessarily within the scope of this conversation, but it's definitely something that is becoming more and more on the uh, prevalent mindset of people as, as time goes on. So when we're talking about nation state style attacks, to circle back to that, how and what do they choose to target? And so it's helpful to identify if you are a target based on what information you have access to and what you think that they want to steal. I think largely, I'm not going to go delve too deeply into targeting, but effectively it's find the information you want, find the person with the least amount of access, or the least privileged person that still has access to that, and then see about different ways that you can go about exploiting it. And this is where it kind of diverts into both a technology program, or a problem, and a personal pro problem. So I'll probably speak less to uh, kind of like the more CIA approach of human and operations and dealing with people and going, you know, you have a gambling problem. Not to pick you out individually. But in, uh, hypothetically, a person has a gambling problem and go, we can fix this externally in exchange for information. Um, we can approach them as a loan shark that is looking for these sensitive documents. Not because we're a foreign nation. I think a lot of people still, I mean, if, if they're a patriotic person that has access to this information, they're not just going to hand it over to China. They're not just going to hand it over to Russia. But if there's a premise that can be built to where they feel less guilty handing it over, like, oh, you know, I work for Northrop Grumman, but I'm selling to uh, a different defense contractor. Ah, that, that feels like American business, right? Not to call out contractors or businesses being, unethi being unethical, but I think for a lot of people that's still, <laughs> for an unethical person, it's within their realm of ethics, which is an interesting uh, thing to identify. I land more on the technology exploitation side of things. Because to me, that's more entertaining and that's my bailiwick. And so it breaks down into the number of different ways that you can target a person for both information, to learn about them, and to using that information in a way that can lead towards your ultimate goal. Uh, and knowing all of that from an attacker perspective is useful so that you don't become one of the attacked. I definitely am vindicated by Edward Snowden revelations because I think before when I talked, uh, people would go, Eric, you need a tinfoil hat. Mm -hmm. And now it's a little bit more, huh, I guess people are spying on people. Uh, both the US government, the Chinese government, the Russian government, they're spying on their own citizens just as much as they are on anyone else. And so when you're in a foreign country, it's something to be incredibly aware of. I spent a lot of time in China, and it's very, I think, funny in that the US spends a lot of time pretending not to spy on its own citizens. And China is the very opposite. You get off the plane, and there's a monitor that's like, we're looking at you, just so you know. Uh, a little box is drawn around your face, and an AI tag is attached to it as you walk through subway stations, as you walk through the city. It's just a general reminder of, we're watching you. <laughs> we're being watched in the United States as well, but we don't have that constant reflected reminder. And it changes your behavior. And it changes your behavior in a little bit of being more aware and operationally secure, but not enough to not fall for potentially different traps. Um, a good example is a cell phone. We all carry a cell phone around with us. Your location can be logged and identified with that cell phone. Uh, if I was building out a clandestine network personally, and I'm a weird person, I get this, uh, I often think about if I were a nation state, or I don't even need to be a nation state to do these different things, what would I do? So one of them is, Bluetooth beaconing, wireless beaconing, uh, and cellular beaconing. So I can see where people are at a given time. You can too. If you bought the stuff on the, uh, if you bought the same things online, spent the same time doing it, and then you think, okay, what can I do with that information? If I want to target you, I can go. She goes to this same bar just about every Wednesday. 
She likes to work out at this Pilates class. This is the general schedule of this person. And then what you can do is you can build and use that technology to combine it with a social profile so that you can bump into that person so that they can have similar interests so that they can be in the right place at the right time to commiserate and gain access. It's, it's a little bit like the movies and a little bit not in that uh, people are very lazy fair with the information. Many people have state secrets on iPads or things that they don't even deem as what would potentially be a state secret. You've got access to your insurance company that's got a million records on a bunch of different stuff about United States citizens. You don't think that a foreign country would be interested in that, but maybe they are. And you would never consider that they would send someone to befriend you and to gain access just to get a hold of your phone for 10 minutes. Sorry to be creepy about that. There's a lot of different creepy things that can happen. Do you guys have questions so far? Just generally terrified. <laughs> All right, that's fair. Um, another good one would be, all right, well, I took some notes then. Probably I would say talking about technology exploitation. So probably worthwhile explaining some of the different ways that we're all vulnerable. Does that seem like a good direction to take? Uh, okay. The Probably the easiest and best one, I mean, 1984 is a very prescient book, but I don't think they would have ever assumed that we would carry around our own personal tracking device uh, that can be accessed anywhere globally. There's a protocol called SS7 that basically handles interoperability of cell phones globally. So when you send a text message, it gets routed anywhere in the world. Uh, and SS7 is part of that. But what we don't realize is the things that we have in our pockets uh, have a what's called a baseband or what connects from your cell phone to the cell tower that we don't exactly know what it does. It's a little bit of a black box. Uh, and while that's somewhat useful, people that write exploits, um, and an exploit being a way to remotely take control of someone's software or hardware, uh, do spend a lot of time at trying to identify, okay, how can I get a remote exploit? And so a remote exploit is the uh, best, best possible thing that you can get. And that's where, remotely, I can gain in what's called root access or full access of your device. Uh, I've been on the internet for a long time, and so remote exploits and things called zero days um, have gone from more of a hacker culture thing, as it were, of breaking in for entertainment, and it's turned into a full-on arms-style deal marketplaces. So right now, like an iPhone O-Day is $2 million. There's groups that will straight up sell them. There's groups that will sell you the opportunity to use them. A good example is, uh, I think it's called NSO Group Technologies, is a firm out of Israel. And they will remotely exploit people's phones for you for a price. Uh, one of their largest customer bases is Saudi Arabia at the moment. And it mainly makes you wonder, uh, as we move into this new realm of nation state spycraft, uh, and it's been going on for a while, a confounding of private entities and public entities because suddenly you have a much more complex level of attribution. Is it the private company that's attacking them? Is it the country of the private company that's attacking them? Is it the country that paid to have them attacked? There's a lot of different questions going on there. Even beyond that, like attribution itself is its own tricky game. I can proxy to China and then hack from China to the United States and then have it look like China's hacking the United States. Is that China hacking the United States? And at that point, are we just choosing to attribute to China because we want that, right? There's a lot of different games that can happen in the cybersecurity world that allow for, uh, it's a dynamic landscape. And so going back to these marketplaces, you can buy remote exploits for any sort of software, for any sort of price. And an O-Day is, or zero day, is something that hasn't been patched that no one else knows about. So... A good example would be, okay, I've done the effort to go, hey, this organization has a Windows Active Directory server that I want to break into. I can look on a market and see, is there a remote exploit for something that's Windows-based that I can break in? If there is, I use that remote exploit. It's not patched. It's not something that can really be defended against. And now I've got access to that organization to steal everything. 
and at that point, with digital information, you don't necessarily even know if it's been stolen. There's companies where they're being told, by the way, five years ago, your crown jewels were stolen. How do you even react to that as an American corporation? Or a foreign country has been in your servers for the past two years. Did you not notice that? Uh, or did you wonder why there was competitors that were hitting the market at the same time as you? That's why. And it's becoming a more and more delicate issue because the internet transcends borders. In a traditional nation-state paradigm, the United States government defends our borders and by virtue of being inside the border, we're defended by our government. But digitally, that's not the case. Digitally, anyone in the world can attack me right now. How do I defend against that? How do I even pretend to defend against that? When I've got a device that's a moving landscape that could be broken into at any time, how do you store information securely? It's very funny. Uh, there's a computer science department at a university that still prints off their students' grades. Uh, and I went, why do you guys still use paper? And then they were like, we don't trust our students and they can't hack the paper. <laughs> and in my head, I was like, well, I mean, I'm pretty good with a lockpick set. I'm sure that they could substitute one in that out, but at least they were trying and they were aware of the issues that were there. Any other questions so far? Yeah, on the zero day, how are they generally deploying that? Because, you know, I'm pretty careful about not just clicking on something in an email or a text message or whatever. Uh, you know, they know like journalists, you know, that are dealing with sensitive information are very careful about those types of things. Absolutely, yeah. So the state of the art right now is uh, Google's a bunch of jerks in a good way. Uh, there's people that are actively scanning the, uh, the internet before um, it was kind of more wide swath based attacks. And now attacks have turned into highly, highly, highly targeted attacks because they don't want anyone to A, see what that zero day is, B, steal it and start using it elsewhere, or C, even worse, start patching it. Uh, so a very recent one that just came out is uh, Google has a, a fantastic write-up of a Chrome zero day. And what it, was, um, what it was targeting and how it was deployed was at a watering hole attack. And so the idea of a watering hole attack is you poison the well that the animals go to. Um, and so in a digital equivalent, you identify a website that people go to that you want to exploit, or you know that person goes to, and then you deploy your attack there. And you try to be as highly specific as possible. So if I wanted to say, attack IWP students or faculty or alumni, and I know that there's a newsletter website, then I would set my target on A, hacking into that website, and then B, deploying malicious code on that website that only attacked people that were already logged into their IWP portal or that were visiting that website. Yeah, no problem. And so that's how it's being deployed right now. Um, interestingly, Google, it's a, the constant trade-off of security and privacy versus, uh, well, privacy versus security. And so Google is able to see that through uh, what's called like an O-Day initiative of looking for uh, I mean, if you use Chrome, suddenly you're a sensor in Google's network, and they're trying to identify, was this computer exploited? We have five computers that were exploited in the same way. Is there any way that we can correlate this information together? And that's a valuable way to do it. Um, <laughs> exactly. Firefox is a fantastic thing to use. Um, it's, it's crazy that extensions like NoScript aren't automatically installed. Um, Ghostery, ad tracking blocking because it's really, I can track people on the internet. If I, just a random guy with a laptop, track people on the internet, there's people that are better funded me, better funded than me already doing it. Uh, one of the most fascinating things that I came across, you think of hackers as lone wolves living in their mom's basement in you know, Siberia, breaking into other people's computers. And uh, I was reverse engineering, and when I say reverse engineering, um, a binary is, you can write software that is readable by humans, then it gets compiled into machine code, which is ones and zeros. I can't read ones and zeros. And so reverse engineering is you can take that and try to identify what that code is doing. And so it was interesting having reversed a binary, and usually with hackers it's very apparent one person just wrote this piece of software. Uh, and in this software there was enough artifacts of information that I could identify that they had a quality assurance team. So like in a regular corporation, there's the people that write the software, and then they QA it, and then they check it, and then they push to production. 
And this was malware. And so it was just this hilarious realization that here's a criminal enterprise stealing credit cards and bank account information. And they're professional enough that there's people programming the application and having people quality assurance check it. It was just one of those, okay, they've reached a level of professionalism that I had no idea. Other questions? Man, I could talk for hours. Um, where are we at on time? About half hour, 45 minutes, like 10 more for the webcast, and then like another continued conversation. Cool. Uh, all right, so that's watering hole attacks. Different ways that you can be attacked, which there's a bunch. Um, what other fun ones? Maybe define a little, talk a little bit more about how people is high value assets. Oh, yeah. Different Yes. Industry. Perfect. Yeah, so the question was explain a little bit more on high value assets and targeting. Which is very funny. I, I didn't realize until recently that when I consider a high value asset, I think that is a person and a human asset, and not a physical asset. Because physical assets are, uh, I don't know how to put that. Like you can steal things, but things aren't worth that much. But information and organizations and knowledge is stuff that you can't put a price on. And so for nation states, in terms of a, a nation state attack, Dealing with cyber criminals, you know what they want. Money, right? Like, if there's not a return on investment with that, they're not going to attack it. Nation states are a lot more tricky. They want to steal information. They have a high level of, um, they have a high aptitude and a large budget for collecting something that they may or may not use. So if a hacker, I mean, it's one of the beauties of capitalism is a hacker is going to try and break into a bank, and if they break into that bank, they'll steal that money and they'll spend it. And you know that cycle is going to happen. But with a nation state, they might break into an organization, do nothing, and then just sit there for a decade because they might want access to that at some point in the future. And that's a lot harder to identify and to trigger. Um, at a major tech company, I did a... Uh, forensic analysis. So they had identified that they had been hacked and the only way that they knew they had been hacked is they had seen information from internal to their system on an external uh, paste bin site. So it had been pasted and they had found it that way and they went, we don't exactly know how we've been hacked but we know we've been hacked. And so I had set up monitoring and on the network uh, my skill was network forensics. So you can lie and have a computer lie to you. So I can have an exploit on your iPhone, and the iPhone will go, there's no exploit on here. But at the end of the day, you have to get that information from the iPhone back to an aggregation server, back to wherever you're trying to get it exfiltrated to. And so I could see every 10 minutes, based on the frequency analysis, a server was beaconing out. And all it was doing was just saying, hey, anything for me? Hey, anything for me? Every 10 minutes. And I was there long enough that uh, every 12 hours, a response would come back and go, hey, send what you got. So it was an aggregation server that was sniffing for passwords and credit card information, putting it into a text file. And then whenever the uh, server said, send what you have, would send it up, which is very tricky to identify. Had I not just been sitting on the network looking explicitly for that, that would have been a very hard thing to identify. And so we shut that down, and then uh, I left that script running by accident, actually, and it turns out that on a different server, because a bunch of servers were into an aggregation switch, and so I was monitoring the switch, a different server was pinging out every seven days and going, hey, anything for me yet? And so when we took offline their first one that was checking every hour, then that seven-day uh, server got hit and went, hey, time to activate. And then you could see a flurry of information. It looked like they had broken, or they had already taken uh, control of this server. So they connected back to this server, broke into another server, and then set that up as their new hourly server. How do you root out something like that? What if they had a server that would ping out once a year? I'm not going to find that. Other people are not going to find that. It's a highly, highly unlikely, which is why once you're exploited, it is incredibly difficult to root that out. Uh, on a personal level, just throw everything out. Uh, <laughs> there's been a few times where my electronics have been out of my personal possession uh, due to a foreign country who wanted to look at them for a couple of minutes. And at that point, you can only assume that they put something on there. 
Like, you just have to start over, and it sucks, because you're like, why'd you guys have to do that? Uh, but that's a very, very real thing that happens to people right now. When you go through the, even the U.S. border, they'll ask to look at your laptop, they'll ask to look at your cell phone, and if you unlock your cell phone and let them walk away with it for even 10 minutes, it's not your cell phone anymore. So when you're identifying and targeting those assets, I view assets as people and the information that they have access to. And so for a country, at the highest level, it's all a board game. It is, what information do I have? What are my objectives? And how can I leverage that information to achieve that objective? Or prevent my opponent's objective? And so that information may be manufacturing locations. That information may be plans on how to build a jet fighter. Uh, it's very dynamic. And so what you see is different teams within these nation states being tasked with different uh, information to achieve. So there's different operating units. Uh, and the general industry term for them now are labeled APTs. So advanced persistent threat is kind of the generic term that's been targeted with these. So they'll say APT12, we think is in charge of breaking into manufacturing sector of the US. And the reason that you can do that is because usually they use a common code base. It's not easy creating these exploits and chaining all the tools and doing all of that. And so when you have a team, they reuse different components. So then we can identify, oh, we just arbitrarily uh, label these guys as APT12, but we've seen these same shared components across four manufacturing organizations. It's fair to assume that there's now an external uh, threat that's goal is strictly to break into the manufacturing sector. That's not that scary when you think about there's an APT for critical infrastructure. There's an APT whose sole goal is to have access to shut down U.S. power, points, power plants at any time. If they shut down power plants, so many more people would be awake. Sorry. Yeah, make jokes, guys. If you're just going to talk for an hour. It's why I don't have a PowerPoint. Uh, but my misspoken uh, word, it was meant to be power plant. And so you would think, oh, if they break into a power plant, their whole goal would just be wreck that power plant immediately, right? But their goal instead is just keeping that in the back pocket and breaking into as many power plants as possible so that if they ever did choose to cause a disruption, they could. Yeah, I was going to ask you about yeah. that. Like, we hypothetically say we moved into Hong Kong to help them to try to just cut the power, do you think? Or do you think they're, they have that capability? Oh man, Hong Kong's tricky. Because technically Hong Kong is China. <laughs> uh, I'm saying if China want to do something, I mean... That's do you, true. Do you think they have the capability to, to do something to us? I mean, we probably have the capability to do something to them as well. I, th I think that's the terrifying realization is we're in a digital cold war and no one's made the first move, thankfully, because anyone could probably shut down any number of hospitals and critical infrastructure in any country at the moment. As a very dark assumption, uh, sorry, <laughs> but I think it's rather true. I, Hong Kong's interesting. I don't think China will intervene with Hong Kong for a lot of different reasons, but if they wanted to, they absolutely could. They could shut down critical infrastructure. They could shut down access to water. Uh, humans are very complacent when they haven't eaten or drank for a while. Uh, but I think... We're still, again, we're still very much in a digital cold war of no country wants to reveal what their cyber capabilities are, uh, so that whenever we do go to war, uh, it'll be very interesting. One of the, one of the best uh, nation-state-based attacks that has a write-up, have you guys heard of Stuxnet? Stuxnet is a fascinating use case, and that's where the U.S. actually was able to target very hyper-specifically Iran, uh, centrifuges for their nuclear program. Like we built something so hyper specific and so targeted that we screwed over their nuclear program for a while. It's amazing. And there's a there's an in-depth article that I highly recommend reading about that because the Stuxnet article is the current level of subterfuge that we have with technology. At some point in the future, uh, everyone could wreck everyone's digital assets and uh, tools. But I think the the fallout in each individual country would greatly outweigh that. You guys got to have some questions. Why don't we um, call a dedicated official talk and then maybe open it up to more questions? 
Yeah, that's perfect. And the official webcast, and then have more. Oh yeah, cool. Thank you, Eric. Thanks, guys.